Hello, good morning. Let me just follow London time. In fact, in my country here is evening. Uh, but anyway, uh, thank you for joining this talk, uh, all the key case friends and the new friends. Uh, now I'm going to share with you my screen. Share here. Well, um, I'm currently working in major university as a full professor in the School of Science and Technology. Uh, but the application cases here are more for, uh, you can see here, is for agriculture application. Okay, uh, agriculture application. In fact, I just by some occasion, I met some professor from the School of Agriculture uh, in Meiji University back to a few years ago. And then he invited me to join his work in some forecasting applications for agriculture. So that's uh, the starting initiating of my projects. Uh, now let's see, uh, as the outline, okay, I should put a full screen, sorry. Okay, uh, as for the outline, I want to briefly mention the idea from AI uh, paradigm shifts and the challenges we are facing when we try to build any real world AI. Okay, and then I followed by two application cases. Uh, all, both of them are in agricultural forecasting. Uh, first, let's see. Uh, AI, we know, uh, has more than 60 years history. In the past more than 60 years, we have actually experienced a few uh, paradigm shifts. Um, quickly, we want to see the very important ones here. From original, only AI, now we are in fact, in fact in the air, AI plus CI, computational intelligence and the soft computing and machine learning. Okay, and in, very, in the very beginning uh, and the sum until uh, 1980s, AI, when people talking about AI is mainly knowledge driven. And then later on with the contribution of machine learning, people pay more attention on data-driven approaches. Now, I believe we are in the air for data plus knowledge-driven. Uh, talking about the real world AI, let's see. Uh, there are some challenges from application domain. Uh, the factor set, basically feature set available may not be always, in, more, may not always uh, be complete. So we, most of the time, we face incomplete set of factors. And the relation among variables involves some uncertainty. And the third one is very, very much uh, we are facing now is the cause effect with imprecise time delay. We know for many AI and machine learning applications, uh, people may not involve time as some factor. So cause effect may not be very practical, very critical issue in most of the applications. Um, however, in forecasting, typically agricultural forecasting, time is very important. And so cause effect is something we have to face all the time. And uh, on the other side, for the problem understanding, we also face a data labeling task. Uh, right now, the data we are using, uh, partly by our colleagues from agricultural school, manually done, and uh, partly some data labeling done by my uh, team member uh, using some machine learning approaches. But uh, for the time limit today, uh, I'm not going to more details about the data labeling. Maybe we find another opportunity uh, to have idea exchange for data labeling. But uh, our possible strategy here we want to propose is a data plus knowledge-driven modeling. Look at here. The key of success for real world AI, CI, machine learning system. We need powerful algorithms, models, convenient tools, plus quality data. It's not any whole data, must be some quality data and reasonable modeling. So 
we have data, suppose they are good enough, and we have available algorithms and machine uh, models, uh, methods offered by uh, recently uh, developed machine learning and AI community, uh, very thankfully. And uh, so we decide which one we want to adopt or which of them we want to adopt. And given the data, and we may decide, we need to decide which part of the data, what are the features we want to select to help our problem solving, to link, to achieve our target intelligent system. On the other hand, we also need very important support from our domain, domain experts. Uh, for example, we are working for the agricultural applications, but my, I myself is not really an agricultural person. I'm not more on the knowledge engineering side. So I definitely need to get some knowledge and domain understanding with the support of our colleagues from agricultural domain. Then we need modeling. Modeling is something to connect available algorithms, tools, to connect the data we have, to connect the knowledge of the background we have, to come out a design for the system. And uh, if we use machine learning, we may have some trained model eventually after we to some uh, appropriate modeling. This can be a target intelligent system with a trained machine learning model together with some other intelligent components together as our out, uh, output result from the development. So now I'm going to see our specific application cases. The first case is a frost forecast. We know frost uh, may happen everywhere in the world uh, due to lower temperature and other relevant weather conditions. Uh, more often happens in earlier fall or later spring and uh, cause very huge cross for damage. You can see the pictures are from everywhere, from European countries, from uh, tropical area, the Asian country. Well, in Japan, this is some picture we took from our Ikuta campus, okay, Image University. You can see the damage caused to the plants. And for Japan, there are some data for fruits, tea, vegetables in the year 2013. And more recently, just last year, last spring, you see uh, the damage on the fruits only from the province of Fukushima. And also in France, you can see some data here. Uh, some people say uh, global warming may help reduce the uh, frost happening. Uh, it's not really true. Uh, in fact, the global warming may even increase the damage of uh, frost. Well, people, of course, will do some action for the frost uh, protection uh, using some uh, protection measures like a fan, uh, sprinklers, and uh, combustion uh, methods, etc. Uh, in the older days, those measures, those actions uh, basically take by human operation. So in that case, need some medium to long-term uh, forecasting, typically one or few days forecasting for action preparation. Uh, nowadays, with uh, automatic control through internet, IoT, uh, we, to, we can connect the things, fans, et cetera, or the related sensors to the internet for some automatic control. In this case, human intervention is no longer a hard necessity. Well, at the same time, we want to have some final resolution of time. That means we need to know what a specific time the frost may happen. Uh, just in one day level, say it may happen tomorrow, we know one day has 24 hours, that's far too uh, sufficient for, for our um, control. So in this case, 
final resolution and a specific at a specific timing and also location can be more preferable. So major challenges we are facing are when is the data resolution? As we mentioned, we need a more special specific uh, time and also location for the uh, frost happening. And uh, also the other is the modeling. Modeling for, for, for forecast of future frost event, not just at this moment. If at this moment, people can actually see if frost happened there, we can see there. So we need something more in the future. How to estimate future readings of those factors? It is not possible using sensor. Okay, on the other side, we also have some practical concerns. When frost protection is taken, we know frost ending time is less concerned. And uh, in fact, when we take uh, um, frost uh, protection action, it may or more or less affect our data collection by sensor equipment. Uh, but there are some practical, um, practical concerns and uh, uh, issues. Uh, probably uh, I would choose to not to talk too much details in today's uh, talk. Well, talking about the data availability, uh, Professor Noborio's uh, research group in the School of Agriculture in my university collected uh, sensor data of relevant environmental factors for frost. Um, at our campus, is a one minute level resolution, very fine, okay? And uh, also later, more recently, they collected uh, data at a vineyard in Hokkaido in Japan. It is at a five minute resolution. Uh, the same group also observed, except air temperature, which uh, most of the uh, weather station and uh, some uh, website uh, forecast possible uh, frost, also including some website uh, provided in US um, by government agencies. They just purely based on air temperature, but actually they find except air temperature, uh, frost has a correlation with other environmental factors, uh, relative humidity, radiation, and wind speed. Uh, it has also been confirmed by later uh, correlation analysis. Uh, so the other point, important things is that the impact of environment factors to frost has some time delay. It's not immediately happening, but accumulate the impact with the time delay. And the interesting thing is that this time delay is not possible to be precisely defined, say exactly we have two hours delay. No, it is just imprecise or say fuzzy. So given the correlation association between frost and environmental factors up to some level, a predictive model can be trained by typical machine learning algorithms with the historical data, we have air temperature, humidity, et cetera, at a time tall, and the frost happening at the same time tall. In this case, since they happen simultaneously at the same time point, uh, when we do modeling or training, we can just simply ignore the time. Okay. However, what we need is a frost at a time T in the future. So if we have the sensor data observation of all these environmental factors at the same time T, any time T given, we can just use the trained model to come out a predicted result at a time T. However, Currently, we are at time T. We want to forecast some future 
frost event at time t plus h. So the sensor data at t plus h in the future is not available. So what we should do? There are some are relevant works for frost forecast by machine learning. Uh, most of the relevant works, they would do the first step to make an estimate of minimal temperature in a future period, such as next day, uh, current night, et cetera, and then to predict frost at a daily level in the future, next day, or et cetera. And then using data from weather station to do this estimate of temperature in the future. And then they later use some machine learning models like a Bayesian classifier, KNN neural networks, uh, and some logistic regression and other classification models, decision trees, etc. Overally, they can reach some level of recall as they reported in their published uh, papers. Uh, you can see this is the level of recall achieved. Well, of course, I should highlight here, uh, since they use the data resolution at a basically daily level, so the recall, the correctness of uh, alarm will also be at a daily level uh, with not really a detailed uh, data resolution. That's the current uh, situation. Okay. Now, uh, we want to talk the modeling we are uh, proposing. Excuse me, I should get my uh, watcher to control my time. The first modeling method uh, we propose is to obtain uh, future values of environment factor at time t plus h to time series forecasting. So typically we use some period of data, historical data uh, to get the time series fitting. And then we can extend it to the future a few days or a few hours or even more longer, okay? And then we get a future frost F the frost F star at time t plus h with forecasted temperature, humidity, and radiation, for example. So in other words, we use the predicted result to further predict the happening of frost, okay? Uh, in this approach, it can be suitable for relatively longer forecasting, a few days or two, one week or so. And uh, however, there is some uncertainty issue. Here I show you just uh, an example. Uh, this is a piece of the water, a uh, piece of the data uh, I got from our ICDA data set. Uh, this is the weather, uh, air temperature data. I use nine days for fitting, then I extend one day. Okay, and uh, the uh, blue one, blue line is the forecast for the day 10. And the red is just overlay of the original data for comparison purpose. Uh, some people will say, hey, the forecasting result is, is not too bad. Seems quite uh, matching the actual situation. However, I would want to try to get your attention on the scheduled area. This is the uh, confidence interval, okay? So that means the result actually shows here, the red line is the center value. Uh, the center value doesn't mean with 100% confidence. In fact, if we want to have some confidence interval, we can see a relatively dark interval is 80% probability confidence interval, okay? And even lighter ones will be 95. Uh, confidence interval. So talking about uncertainty, um, they are in, as extreme, there can be two kinds of uh, uncertainties, uh, so-called 
coconut uncertainty and subway uncertainty. Uh, subway uncertainty is well uh, behaved. Is will will be uh, easier for for uh, modeling and prediction. Uh, however, for coconut uncertainty, it's almost uh, uh, impossible to make a prediction. Uh, we assume uh, weather conditions as climate uncertainty should be somehow between the two. So it is still possible for us uh, through some uh, appropriate modeling to reduce such uncertainty. So we come out to second modeling methods. Uh, I want to introduce the concept of causal modeling. Uh, we know the occurrence of frost follows some physical process taking place in time, uh, temperature, humidity, etc. Et they have impact to frost with a delay in the effect. So we want to capture some imprecise causal relation between the past observations of environmental factors until time t and uh, future frost at time t plus h. So we try to build such a prediction, predictive model. Uh, in this case, we actually insert an explicit time delay in our modeling. So you can see for the input size, we have temperature, humidity, radiation, etc until time t, but the output side is not at the same time, but in some time point in the future, okay? Of course, we know such a causal relation involves imprecision and certainty. So we take some moving averages of inputs, not just a single point. That's to cope with the imprecise delay. So we take some input granulation. And uh, this model is uh, more suitable for some short-term forecasts, such as a few hours. Uh, the reason is that when the time uh, gets longer, uh, such a causal relation becomes weak and with more dynamics involved uh, will affect the performance, the accuracy. And uh, assume we, we understand the modeling to the method two, uh, the frost event is related to prior movement of environmental factors a few hours back. With this assumption, we now introduce another new concept we call alarm period. This alarm period is that prior to occurrence of frost by something we call relabeling. relabeling. We relabeling re the target variable. In this case, what we are trying to do is to reflect modeling idea to some relabeling of our target variable here. Uh, for example, you see here for the illustration, we have frost event during this period. Okay. And then we extend it to back a few hours. If we expect two hours alarm period. So then we will move back two hours. We set this, the red line as our target. We call frost plus alarm period. So after relabeling, when we do train for a machine learning model, we use just a typical way as currently most of the machine learning uh, algorithms doing. So in this case, we can tell since there's no time delay involved because we already done the relabeling. So the learning task can be similar, uh, can be simpler than the modeling two method. And this, of course, this way is also suitable for short-term forecast. Uh, there are some reasons for the variable granulation, but I try to uh, skip them. Uh, well, on the target variable, uh, variable side, besides the input, we can do some variable granulation. At the output side, we can also carry some uh, 
granulation. Uh, some groups here without um, granulation as the derived uh, target variables for us after one hour, after two hours or three hours, all plus one hour, two hours, three hours uh, alarm period. And uh, if we do with uh, uh, data granulation our target variable, we can have some frost, one hour average chance of frost from now, or maybe after a certain period, but it is in one, er one hour average. Or maybe we can have flexible period for the average from now on in a few hours uh, average the uh, chance of frost, etc. So as a summary, we have tried a family of modeling methods uh, with or without variable granulation, with or without time delay, okay? Uh, now I just quickly uh, show you some uh, experiments result. Uh, we first we use the data set collected in ICTA campus with some uh, features. We try to support vector machine or uh, support vector machine for regression. Okay. Uh, the reason we adopt the support vector machine is that uh, we know the frost data is a highly imbalanced data. That means the period for frost is much less than no frost. So if we do classification, of course, this is a in advantage for the model performance. Well, support vector machine uh, is superior compare, compared to other methods for classification in handling unbalanced data. Okay. Um, overall, we can see uh, without target uh, granulation, then we use uh, classification models, average performance for precision and recall is here. Uh, here I want to uh, highlight is that uh, typically in our case for uh, frost forecast, we do not use accuracy, general accuracy. Uh, the reason, as I mentioned, the data is highly imbalanced. So if we use accuracy, uh, we may have very high accuracy, but it doesn't really helpful because uh, in extreme case, we can just make a prediction, say all the time, no uh, forecast. Then the accuracy may still achieve more than 80% accuracy. Okay. Uh, well, with, if we apply uh, granulation on the target variables, then we use uh, regression models. Of course, we need to uh, select some uh, treasure. Okay. Uh, the overall uh, performance is here, all of them at a one minute level. And then uh, we also tried the newer data uh, collected in Hokkaido. Uh, you may note here, uh, we use uh, two sets of the data. One is uh, in later uh, spring and uh, one is in early fall. Uh, we use the training data from uh, later spring and we do test on the data early for. So you can see this experiment is much more challenging because we collected the data from different seasons. Okay, uh, we still use a support vector machine uh, for classification. And uh, we also use some moving average with exponential uh, moving average calculation. Uh, as the results here, uh, recall all the results, all the models with the recall rate very high, but uh, on the other side for precision, some is reasonable, some a bit poor, okay? Uh, but earlier I mentioned, in fact, for frost forecast, for the protection purpose, frost beginning is always much more important. Uh, once we start to take a protection action, the frost ending is uh, less uh, concerned, right? And uh, some results here for your reference. Uh, overall, we also set up a frost alarm uh, system framework here. Uh, we put uh, the sensor there, collected real-time sensor data, 
and upload it to the cloud. And uh, then through the API and uh, our predictive model, download the data. Of course, not every minute after a certain period, we obtain the data, we download the data. And uh, download the data, then through the predictive model, we come out to the result to say after certain time, uh, the frost will happen, etc. Uh, you can see this is the message actually sent to everyone's mobile phone, smartphone. Uh, I myself also, this, in this season, I received the alarm uh, from time to time. Uh, here you see some alarm, somehow uh, just uh, 40 minutes, 15 minutes, some the time, seems the time is rather short. Uh, I want to highlight here is that we use the frost after one hour model here, okay? And uh, due to the uh, networking online, the cloud uh, situation, we may not always get the latest data. So this is the situation. Uh, if we, the user, the farmer prefers some longer, a bit longer uh, forecast period, we can change the model to be two hours or three hours, etc. Okay, so the notification uh, can be set by, or maybe the other way can be sent by email, etc. Okay, there are some ongoing works. Okay, uh, we recently also proposed ensemble modeling to further improve the performance uh, to combine uh, multiple models with a tif different uh, time delay setting. So it's the combination, the performance can be improved. Now I'm going to uh, talk about the second application case is for greenhouse gas GHG forecasting. Uh, this application uh, shares some features uh, characteristics with uh, frost forecasting, but can be even more are difficult uh, in terms of modeling. Uh, as the background, we know uh, methane is CH4 is one of the greenhouse gases. It's about uh, near 16% for the entire, for the, all the uh, greenhouse gases. However, in terms of the contribution to greenhouse effect, uh, CH4, the methane contributes quite a lot you can see the situation. So as the uh, current practice, how people try to reduce the rate of meta. Uh, as a current practice, uh, practitioners, they will try to do water drainage from uh, padding field from time to time, but there's no standard uh, regulation time is more like a need-based decision. Uh, when they look at some situation based on experience, they sit, decided to say, hey, I need to do water drainage. But as we know, uh, the rice need water. So the plants need water. So after a while, even they do data water drainage, after a while, they need to add water again. So how should they decide a right timing, right timing for, for water drainage? That's some uh, topic, some uh, task given to us for the uh, forecast or for meta. Uh, so far until now, most of the relevant uh, studies are focused on the estimation of uh, GHG emission. So they use typically use the temperature as a key factor in meta uh, estimation. And there are also some powerful tool like a DNDC is a very powerful simulation model uh, can simulate uh, to estimate many things, not only meta, it's very powerful. However, to utilize such a powerful model, uh, we need to provide many things. Um, some internal parameters need to be provided and some of them can be rather hard to obtain. And uh, 
one more important thing, the DNDC cannot predict the future GN, GHG emission. So what do we try to do? Um, for the current stage, our objective is to get an intelligent system that offers meton high forecast to help practitioners in water management to reduce meton. Uh, we choose not to specifically estimate the meton, but the rather the time of meton high. Uh, in this case, the practitioners, they may set some level roughly for the meton high. And uh, once we can give some signal or say some uh, alarm, say, hey, there is a risk that the CH4 emission will increase to a higher level shortly if no action is taken. So this kind of alarm will be useful for them to make a decision and take some action. So the time of metan high can be more useful than specific uh, estimate of metan at the current moment or some future point. With this target in mind, of course, the very first thing is the data collection. Uh, right now, my uh, colleagues from School of Agriculture are trying very hard uh, to collect some data from the actual domain. Uh, this is from Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology. Uh, however, uh, the data collected need some, uh, a lot of a task and more effort to make it ready to be used for machine learning. So at this moment, we have to start our experiment with some available data uh, back to some years ago. Uh, this is the, is the data set we use for our experiment at this stage. Uh, by the way, this project just started early last year uh, with, the, with the less one year time. Okay. Uh, so we choose here, I show you three factors. One is the actual flux, is a target uh, meta. And the other is air temperature and also soil water content, the three of them. From data analysis, we find some reasonable correlation uh, between uh, CH4 and the temperature, both so air temperature and the soil temperature. However, we know a uh, soil temperature is related um, to some soil water content and some other situation. And also for the measure of soil uh, content uh, temperature is very much um, related to the depth of sensor installation, the sensor setting. So uh, it's less stable and uh, less uh, comparable. So we decided to use air temperature plus air temperature and the soil uh, temperature is highly correlated. Okay, however, unfortunately, we failed to find a clear correlation uh, between CH4 methane and the soil water content. Uh, seems this is very interesting because people believe uh, through the water drainage, water management can effectively, uh, sorry, I see. Okay, let me try to answer later. Uh, I saw some uh, chat. Sorry. How to remove this, sorry. So now uh, I want to show you uh, some uh, plot. It is the soil water content and also CH4 relationship. Of course, uh, the range is too wide, so we use a log here. From here, you can see 
uh, the correlation between the soil water content and the CH4 is not very uh, strong, but uh, of course not absolutely known. Um, very interesting part is here. Here, soil water content is relatively high in this area. However, just in this area happened the, soil, uh, the CH4 is uh, relatively low. And uh, uh, we tried to consult our colleagues from the domain and they gave some possible um, explanation is that the uh, rice crop relies on water. So water drainage may be carried out for reducing methane, but very soon after that water fueling is needed. So this area may be indicating that the periods shortly after water fueling. So when the methane still remains at some low level, because we know microbial, um, the bacterial microbial activity is not yet very highly active. Okay, so of course we need a further investi investigation. With such a situation, um, we see from the problem domain, we know the impact of environmental factors to the CH4 is of accumulated cause effect with time delay, but not precisely defined. So we know typically straightforward to use machine learning method is not suitable. So our strategy is using some combining human knowledge of the decision with analysis of measurement data. Uh, it's a hybrid approach. Uh, look at here, how human experts are uh, from the domain make a judgment. Uh, first, observe, first they observe patterns as human experts, they will see, look at the patterns of the recent trends of relevant factors, temperature, soil water content, etc. They look at the patterns. And then they make a judgment to say, hey, the CH4 may or may not increase shortly. Well, we want to highlight, I highlight a few words here. Let's see. Recent trends, how long is the period? They look at the three days or one week or five days data. There's no precise limitation, no precise definition. What does it mean shortly? Again, no precise definition. And the overall judgment may not be clearly described in any mathematical model. So what to do? We ask the first question. When they say trends, trends plays a very important role. So how to capture the trends of a factor? Now we take the air temperature, time series data. We tried to do decomposition of time series. Here we note there are some periods, two periods of data missing. Uh, it's about uh, near, near one week here, about three days data missing. Uh, so you can see the data set we get is not very excellent, uh, somehow quite poor missing data periods, but we still try to see the overall trends. Then we also try to do decomposition on the CH4. Uh, in fact, the CH4 data is not really a typical time series data because time series data means the past may somehow determine the future, but it's not a typical time series data. But we try to do decomposition as well uh, the purpose is that we try to find some relation patterns between the temperature, air temperature, and the CH4. Uh, something interesting, we find uh, some patterns here. When a air temperature trend goes up and a CH4 trend somehow also goes up. Okay, and uh, look at here. Uh, we know Without decomposition, air temperature typically changes in the daytime and the nighttime. So they are uh, very uh, regular, also strong 
uh, seasonality pattern, seasonality component uh, of uh, air temperature. So we try to just get overall trend to eliminate the daily pattern. Well, that's the relation pattern. So now let's quickly go to the solution outline, uh, very much related to our modeling approach. Uh, we create a polynomial regression to fit the curve of the trend data of the air temperature. And uh, it is, we use just one week and a day we shift by one, way, one day. Shift one day, we make the extension. And uh, then we also, fit the curve of actual trend data from observation by polynomial regression. And we compare the two curves, okay? And uh, see whether there is some significant change or see significant difference. If there is, that means the data, the temperature is in something trend change is unstable or say is with some new trend of change. Okay, if yet not, we go back to continue this process. Once we capture some significant change in trend, then we start to fit polynomial regression model for the CH4. And then after that, we extend this polynomial regression model to some future time. And uh, once we find the predicted, this uh, level exceed the level of tre treasured setting, then we calculate the time on the horizontal dimension. We calculate the time. So from this time point, we can say, okay, around the future sometime, the CH4 may likely give a higher level, exceed a higher level. Okay, that's the overall approach I quickly uh, explained. Uh, of course, there are some explanation why we use uh, uh, polynomial regression, et cetera, uh, because we know polynomial regression is a parametric regression, so easy for us to do the comparison, also extend to the future. And why we start temperature first, we know temperature from here, we did some analysis. Uh, the trend change happened in temperature somehow appears uh, before that of CH4. Okay, uh, some preliminary test results. Uh, we use our approach roughly capture the five alarm and put back to the, uh, CH4 data, we find uh, some alarm seems reasonable right before the highest level of CH4, but some seems not very correct. And this one didn't capture. Uh, after comparison, we find uh, these two period is just about right after the period of missing data of air temperature. So that's uh, you see, uh, using our approach uh, very much relies on the continuity of air temperature data. Okay, uh, we are still um, continuing doing some work, exploring some new approach uh, and uh, refine the current approach. Uh, we want to thanks to our colleagues from agricultural school, Professor Nobori O and uh, some young uh, researchers, and also to university. Our university provided some research funding and for the company uh, Meter in US offered us the uh, equipment. And as la at last, I want to thank my uh, young team members from uh, my research uh, laboratory. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for your for your very interesting talk. And um, we, we are now open for some questions. I've already got one in for you, for you, Professor Ding. Um, I'm just turning on my 
my video. Should I turn off a screenshot or something? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay. We've got one from a Tom Herrick. Harry Ann, dear Professor, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation of yours. I'd like to ask you about the true false estimated coefficients. Do you think the ROC analysis would be useful in your case with frost forests? Uh, I, oh, just now I saw some chat question, but during the uh, talk, I couldn't uh, go to the details. Yes, of yeah. ROC, of course, it is useful. Uh, in fact, uh, in some of our previous uh, published papers, uh, we use this ROC analysis to uh, come out with some conclusion, but uh, the result is consistent with our uh, flaws I provided here. Wow. Yes. Excellent. Um, we've had another one coming from Jun Liu. Uh, thanks for an interesting talk. You've mentioned in the beginning about data and knowledge, data and knowledge driven, but your talk mm -hmm. of case studies are mainly on data driven. I did not see much about data and knowledge. Any clarification about? I'm quite interested on, on how knowledge can be combined and incorporated with data driven in the integrated way, and how does the performance how does the performance has been improved based on that? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, when I say uh, knowledge, the knowledge, in fact, in our modeling, why we use time delay, explicitly insert the time delay in our modeling. And uh, also in the later for the CH4 forecast, the modeling algorithm itself is very much based on the domain knowledge, domain experience. This is knowledge, but it's not really in some explicit format like rules, cases, uh, semantic networks. It's not that in there, that kind of knowledge representation, but in fact, the modeling itself is already make use of the knowledge, domain knowledge. Only with the pure data, we may not come out to such modeling. Great, thank you. I'm just waiting. Oh, we've got another another question, um, dear professor. The poly uh, again from Tom, uh, hey Jan, uh, dear professor. The polynomial regression within methane analysis is really useful. However, I've seen the data slide forty seven on hetero sedacity <laughs> would be a problem in the case of the time series. Maybe volatile uh, modeling threshold. Gash in particular with the T, T student distribution would be also useful. Thank you once again for the, your lovely presentation. Thank you for good. highlighting the point. Uh, I didn't get enough time to explain that. Uh, we know for uh, as for regression model, polynomial regression is not the most powerful one in terms of the performance accuracy, etc. But however, in our case, uh, Accuracy, of course, important, but we focus more on the parameter. We want to use the parameter to make an extension to the future and for comparison. So we need a, a parametric model. That's the reason we must use the polynomial regression, but no other like a support vector regression. <laughs> Professor Lyder, I'd like to thank you once again for a very interesting talk. And I'm going to bring this session to a close and like to say thank you everyone for attending and. Uh, good evening, good goodbye, and, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.